Chapter 4, Title 4.3, Power Revisited In the introduction to this section, I have pointed towards several critical features of Foucauldian power. The most important of those is probably power's productivity. Power is not the force which represses, but which positively makes us who we are. Only within the sphere of power can any kind of subjectivation take place. Foucault so points out that if it is only power in its concrete flow and workings in and on us that forms us, then the individual human being is not all power's opposite number, but on the contrary, one of power's first effects. It is only upon the basis of this being constituted and on the premise of acknowledging this constitutedness through and within power that the possibility for an active practice of the self opens up. Subjectivation can only occur within and on the basis of power relations. In the Foucauldian rendering, an outside of power would therefore also not be the originary zone of freedom, but on the contrary, an outside of power is only thinkable as a zone of anomie and violence. If power is what makes us who we are, if power is the active agent of subjectivation, stepping outside of power or being brought outside of power means being deprived of every possibility for individuation and subjectivation. The other of power is so not freedom, but domination and violence. Violence. Jenny Edkins and Veronique Pinfat retake this crucial point on power as follows. A relationship of violence acts upon a body or upon things. It forces, it bends, it breaks, it destroys, or it closes off all possibilities. Its opposite pole can only be passivity, and if it comes up against any resistance, it has no other option but to try to break it down. A power relationship, on the other hand, can only be articulated on the basis of two elements that are indispensable if it is really to be a power relationship. That the other, the one who over whom power is exercised, is recognized and maintained to the very end as a subject who acts, and that faced with a relationship of power, a whole field of responses, reactions, results, and possible inventions may open up. Power thus is not a figure that concerns only a single individual. Power in each instance is always relational. It is something that flows between concrete individuals. Power also does not exist as an abstract, but only ever in its concrete manifestations. It is always local. The importance of this relational component in Michel Foucault is such that his whole work has also been classified as a philosophy of relation by vain. The self gains its specific shape by virtue of being located as a certain juncture within the crisscrossing net of relationality as it is co-determined by power. Relationality is the feature that determines the shape of the self. As long as relationality is set up in a way that allows for the possible reversion or at least modification and change of those relations, then power can still flow and freedom and active subjectivation remain a possibility. And here one encounters another facet of power. Just as subjects are formed through the exercise of power, they simultaneously always also are forming others with whom they are in relation. Power is the basic condition of human life and ultimately only through power also the possibility for the active self-formation of the subject opens up. An art of the self only becomes possible within power. This gives meaning to the famous Foucauldian phrase that there can be no power without freedom and that power is exercised only over free subjects 
and only insofar as they are free. Freedom opens up as a possibility only within power. To turn the above statement around, wherever power ceases, subjectivation is also no longer possible and one is neither constituted as a human being nor does the option remain available to constitute oneself as such. It is when the relations between people ossify, become inflexible, petrify, and ultimately turn unchangeable and set in stone, that power also ceases and becomes something different. It turns into domination. Domination arises each time the relations between people are set in a way they are no longer reversible and any attempt at change is prevented and blocked. Individually, this state of being when power is blocked leads to anomie and violence, whilst the continued individuation is disrupt and the subject in its being is thrown into complete disarray. From the above follows a further point of great importance. In this rendering, the subject is not a pre-given essence, but on the contrary, a form, and one which is not always or primarily identical to itself. The subject is a form that receives its concrete shape and is imbued with a distinct life in the always relational flow of power. In different relations to different people, this subject will so take on a different form, present itself differently and thus become differently. There is no essence to recur to which could constitute the true self and so would serve to establish the distinction to a mere mask. Alienation, like is posited in the Marxist analysis, so loses its point of reference because there is no longer a true self from which one could be alienated and no imprisoned nature waiting to be liberated. We thus become partially different, whether we act in a concrete situation as mother or father, teacher, worker, lover, friend, etc. And it is in this sense that we are, as Foucault asserts, not identical to ourselves. To say that the subject is a form connects us to the idea of transformation expounded in the third chapter. It is to imply that it is not a pre-given substance, but that the subject has a history and a future. Quote, In the course of their history, men have never stopped constructing themselves. That is to say, continually displacing their subjectivity, constituting themselves in an infinite and multiple series of different subjectivities, which will never come to an end and will never bring us face to face with something which would be man. Foucault. Having established these points, it so becomes possible to tackle the crux of the question of power that has eluded us so far. While the above lines have provided a general approximation towards that phenomenon which is called power, still the picture remained incomplete in many ways. With the strategic play of discourses and practices, with their effects on subjectivation, and with the question of what happens when the relations become unchangeable, only Apollonian elements of subjectivation have been analyzed, and indeed seen from this view. It is also only logical that domination is what happens when this Apollonian element purifies or becomes hegemonic. However, what is still missing in this account is a way of reckoning with the Dionysian. We will thus, in the following, try to complete the picture with approaching an energetic power. 4.4. Energetic power. I would like to focus first on the concept of relationality and its connection to subjectivation. With the view of the Dionysian Apollonian in mind, one can approach the concept of relationality in the following way. Any relation, to begin with, always has two interconnected components. On the one hand, the aesthetic component, 
which in this instance could also be termed the formal or systemic. Any relation one finds oneself engaged in always takes place in an already pre-given larger context, which to a certain degree defines subjectivity in that concrete relation. Whether one is engaged in the relation between mother and daughter, friend and friend, teacher and pupil, or any other imaginable type of engagement, there always is a certain formal or systemic setting, which in part determines the concrete shape of this relationality. What the connotations of being a teacher, mother, friend, daughter, pupil, etc. will carry might not be open to a universally valid description, will vary and change with each context and societal setting. Still, this Apollonian systemic component is always there and in principle amenable to a concrete analysis and can be described rationally. This is also, indeed, what Michel Foucault has done so masterfully in his analysis of discourses and practices. Any relation, so, is in part determined by this systemic, aesthetic or Apollonian quality. However, it is also true that almost no relation is determined completely by this element. No matter how exacting, rigid or detailed those systemic and formal elements and rules are, only in its extreme outer reaches is the relation totally determined by them. For anything else, there is always this other element which plays a part in any relation and will also co-shape its concrete form, however without being completely open itself to rational analysis. This element has been called many different names in different contexts, emotion, concretely as desire in Deleuze or pleasure in Foucault, spirituality, the libidinal or sexuality, the drives, affection, etc., and we have here identified it as the Dionysian. Any relation is thus the concrete interplay of the Apollonian and Dionysian, and both those elements together in their mutual conditioning will determine the distinctive form this relation will take. Together with the different relationalities also, our subjectivity is formed. To complete the Foucauldian rendering of power, it would need to be energized. We have so far called this X that flows through the systemic and aesthetic element Dionysian energy. An energetic account of power can build on the elements of the Foucauldian analysis, relationality, discourses and practices, but adds to this rational Apollonian description a transrational Dionysian twist. In an energetic power, one can still assert that the subject is formed and forms itself in a concrete relationality involving discourses and practices. But the concrete form this relationality will take is not just determined by discourse and practice without residue. Through discourse and practices, energy flows. It shapes them and is in turn shaped by them. In an energetic power, the relationality leading to subjectivation is not just determined rationally by Apollonian discourses and practices, but just as well by the energetic element that is also carried through them and within them. The emotional quality, for example, that is conveyed through an utterance is just as important as what is rationally said and only their interplay determines the shape the concrete relationality that is influenced by this quality will take. We can so make use of the many tools and concepts of the Foucauldian analysis of power including his idea of the self as form via enriching them with an energetic component. An energetic power thus is literally a force which flows in and through the individual person 
An energetic power could be likened to the picture of electricity flowing through electrical networks. Pushing this metaphor one step further, one can also take up the Foucauldian picture of the subject as relay for power. In the concept of an energetic power, the subject might similarly be likened to a relay station which receives, transforms, and transmits energy along aesthetic lines. Energetic power so becomes a flowing force, the force of life. This force is not identical to discourse and practices, but is intertwined with and transmitted through them. Discourse and practices may influence a certain form of life, a mode of subjectivation. Equally, they can be the expression of a distinct life, but they are not identical to it. Discourse and practices are the visible, co-determining expression of the force of life which flows through them, but which itself is not rationally apprehensible. Discourse and practices are the aesthetic element which always goes together with an energetic force of life, energetic flow of power. Discourse and practices are open to rational description and analysis, as Foucault has shown so masterfully. The energetic power is transrational and can only be experienced, not described. Together, they are a different expression for the Apollonian and Dionysian interplay. It so becomes possible to posit an aesthetic energetic sphere. This sphere might be conceived as a space from which human subjectivation arises, as the relational sphere of which the self is a part. It is in this sphere of energetic power within which human life takes place, but which is simultaneously formed by this life and co-extensive to it. The self that emerges within this sphere is always relational, and in this sense, transpersonal. 4.5. The Relational Self Working with this concept of the aesthetic energetic sphere, it so becomes possible to sketch a transpersonal becoming. In both the active and passive moments of becoming, subjectivation is shaped in relationality, by that which and those who surrounds us just as well as by ourselves. One is thus constantly engaged in a process of polyvalent transmission and reception along aesthetic energetic lines. In this process, the self is shaped just as it shapes others in turn, embedded in a sphere of energetic power. Instead of being a clear-cut, separated and distinct shape, the form of the self could thus better be described as a certain density, an ever-shifting constellation within this aesthetic energetic sphere. The self is not different from the aesthetic energetic sphere, but forms part of it and also, in turn, co-forms this sphere from which it cannot be separated. This rendering is conceptually close to Deleuze and Guattari's rhizomatic plateaus as shifting zones of intensity, defined by their constantly transforming connectivity, without being organized in the hierarchical order of an arborescent arbor system. In their seminal work, A Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari develop the notion of the rhizome against the hierarchical Cartesian tree of knowledge, and what they call the arborescent understanding of the world built thereupon. In an initial sketch, the self can so be perceived firstly as part of an aesthetic energetic sphere in which secondly its form is emergent through relationality. Thirdly, the self can so not be separated from the sphere of which it forms part. But there is no longer a clear separation towards the others with whom the self is in relationality. Going one step further beyond Foucault, one can draw here on a concept derived from the psychoanalysis to clarify this last point. Artist and psychoanalysist Braca Ettinger, 1914-1930, 
proposes to conceptualize the self as severality. The term severality implies that the self is always co-formed and co-forming in a connecting and disconnecting with those others who are concretely around it. From them, it is not completely distinct, but engaged in a constant process of differentiation in togetherness. The self is thus not singular, but always plural. Unlike in an endlessly schizoid multiplicity, in which the self is made up of an infinite amount of connecting parts, the famous thousand plateaus, Braca Ettinger proposes that the self is not formed by endlessly different influences and connecting points, but by certain, specific yet shifting, constellations with partial others who co-determine and influence its becoming. Griselda Pollock captures Ettinger's concept of a subject as plural already from inception, as at least several, but not infinite. Ettinger herself sees subjectivation as a process of differentiation in co-emergence and co-fading. Relationality is thus the basic human condition, not to be connected, not to form, and be formed in relationality becomes unthinkable. The self turns into a severality from which others are never completely different, never total, but always only partial others. And what arises can so be termed a transsubjectivity. What this interpretation serves to bring to the forefront is an element which has been inherent in Foucault's analysis, but which he never specified, and which has been lacking in the study so far. It is an account of how the self as form is not an individual form, but a transpersonal form, intricately connected to the lives of others. Foucault's meticulous tracings of power can help in sketching this aesthetic energetic sphere as many of Foucault's visualizations and tools of analysis can now be applied to an energized power. All subjectivation thus takes place within this sphere, and only as part of it does the self, as form, take shape. Moreover, it can be asserted that within that sphere of mutually codependent becoming, an art of the self is never a work just on the self, as its effects will flow through the lines of connectivity towards the partial others and become part of the mutual co-determination. Also, any blockage that occurs, any trauma or violence, consequently, is also never just an individual occurrence, but produces echoes throughout the sphere and with the co-determined others. This also opens the door to, for example, intergenerational transmissions as residual aesthetic energetic traces may linger on and continue to exert influence even if the concrete lives have already faded away. The term individual at this point furthermore becomes misplaced. Already in chapter 2, identity has been found to be a misnomer. For one does not remain identical to oneself from one moment to the next. Similar can be affirmed from the individual as individuum, a unit which cannot be divided. The subject in this rendering is no longer indivisible, and neither is it a singular unit separable from its surroundings. The truth that can be constituted in practices of the self is the contingent and momentary truth deriving from an instant of relational becoming and remaining tied to it. No overall truth of the self can hold sway any longer. What truth arises is actively formed, established and constituted, and not a pre-given objective fact or essence of the self, which could be found and deciphered. This truth is established in transformation and is always relational and contingent. It does hold true for this emergent moment of becoming with which it arises, but without the guarantee or promise of permanence.
What merits and qualifies this truth is merely its potential for giving a new and different perspective, a new and different knowledge of the self, which can thus foster further transformations. However, having thusly served its purpose, this weak truth may well fade again with new transformations. Opening the possibility for such an active transformation of the self in the transpersonal energetic aesthetic sphere, it is possible to use different venues, different practices and approaches, and also different stimuli to effect the transformation. Michel Foucault has pointed to the transfiguring experience of pleasure, and Gilles Deleuze names it desire. Desire with Deleuze can open up a line of flight towards a deterritorializing becoming. Michel Foucault argues the use of pleasure for a similar purpose. Pleasure, in Foucault's understanding, has the potential to wrest us away from the bounding discourse on sexuality, which ties us to a sexualized and naturalized identity, towards an opening of spaces and becoming, which can be found in a pleasure that is understood as an experiment, an experience, which is each time new. In the reading proposed here, both desire and pleasure can be used in an aesthetic and energetic practice, for a transformation of the self. It is indeed in this approach that the famous argument about desire-pleasure can be bridged. Foucault rejects the possibility of becoming through desire and argues that desire is always perceived as a lack, as an argument out of the negative, whereas Deleuze contrarily points to pleasure as being bounding and territorializing. For a discussion of those diverging views, see Gilles Deleuze's essays on desire and pleasure. 1997. As Patricia McCormack points out, the experience of pleasure can be as much a vector for transformation and transfiguration as desire, if the former is understood as setting into action a process of becoming, a spark after which the self is not returned happy or satisfied, but disrupted, irreversibly changed or affected. Wilhelm Schmidt asserts in a similar manner that the experience of pleasure is not at all sedentary or tranquilizing, but on the contrary, that which pushes us to our limits towards transgression and transformation of the self. Quote, in the concept of the art of living pleasure is neither goal nor aim, but rather a means and instrument for the fashioning and transformation of the self. All of the above authors finally conceptualize the self as intimately linked to a bodily experience. Especially in Michel Foucault, this embodied experience of the self is highly significant, as the different lines of relationality mainly attach on to the body, affect, and even form it, and as it is also via the experience of the body that the self is formed. However, in all of those authors, the body is an experience rather than a substance. With this stipulation, therefore, nothing has been said about the concrete form of this experience. Hence, there is also no such thing as a natural unmediated body for any of those authors, which can take multiple possible forms. Venturing further in our hybridization of different traditions, it is also of significance that therapists like Braca Ettinger use art in their trauma work as possibility for opening up a similar venue of transformation. As Ettinger points out, art can have this quality of becoming a transport station of trauma, even though there is no guarantee that through the practice of art a trauma can surface and be transported and thus the self be transformed. Quote, the place of art is for me a transport station of trauma, a transport station that more than a place is rather a space that allows for certain occasions of occurrence and of encounter.
the transport is expected in this station. And it is possible. The transport station does not promise that the passage of remnants of trauma will actually take place in it. It only supplies the space for this occasion. This observation fits very well with the findings from the last chapter guarding the enigmatic yet potentially transformative qualities of art and artwork. In distinction from the Hellenistic mode of subjectivation, the art of the transpersonal self can so give rise to practices which, besides being used for giving one's life a certain style, can also specifically be used for therapeutic purposes. This study so starts to move into the realm of a contemporary practice, which while recurring to certain stylistic elements of an older, ancient art of the self, puts those elements to new and different uses. The Greek mode becomes a distant memory, to which it is possible to look for input in some aspects, but from which the modern subject will necessarily have to differ in its means and ends. 4.6. An affirmative practice. A life-affirming and transformative practice of the self thus consists in shaping the flow of power, channeling energy through certain constellations of discourse and practices, and conversely using the energetic to partially change the effects of discourse and influence practices. And this cannot be achieved through theoretical endeavors, although a certain moment of cognitive insight might also be the first step, but can only occur in the experiential practice of an art of the self that is simultaneously aesthetic and energetic, and takes both elements into account. Such a practice might be found as working with emotion and spirituality, but just as well with sexuality or with the aesthetics of a discourse. In this light, a sexual practice can be just as transformative as a spiritual one, and indeed very often the two coincide in the same. This is to use a non-European example, the case in the tantric yogic practice where ritual sexual union is used as a vehicle for inducing spiritual experiences. Such an expression of the Dionysian might subsequently be perceived not as a permanent orgy, but as an act of the celebration of life in all its transformative and transfiguring qualities. Turning the above around and following the logic of purity to its extremes, it becomes clear that the only way in which a complete determination of relationality through the systemic would be possible is in the form of an Apollonian hegemony. This hegemony can now be perceived as concomitant to to the figure of domination understood as the outside to an energetic power. In domination, the relations have been stratified and rigidified to such an extent that the transformative flow of energetic power ceases. A blockage of power occurs. In domination arises in the instant when the mutual influencing interplay between the energetic and its rational co-determining elements of practices and discourses is no longer possible, because the latter have been set in a way that their strategic, rational imperative can no longer be altered. Domination thus would be a form and expression of the Apollonian hegemony and of the rule of the formal and aesthetic over content. In this way, several findings of the last chapters can be drawn together. Already, the first chapter gave some insights on what such a striving for purity in its extreme forms leads to. It was there described as the negation of the force of life through the triumph of what Walter Benjamin called the aesthetic politics. Alternatively, it can be rendered with Wolfgang Dietrich as the attempted suppression of the Dionysian or drawn from the section called Bare Life with Giorgio Agamben 
What lies at the basis of all those components is the striving for complete formalistic determination of relationality and the simultaneous denial of the force of life. Yet it also needs to be pointed out, in light of the above depiction of an aesthetic energetic sphere of life, that the Dionysian energetic can never be suppressed indefinitely, but will always resurface. It forms part of the very sphere in which subjectivation takes place and cannot be withheld forever, or only at terrible cost. Any Apollonian attempt at purity thus remains an unfinished striving, and it is this very impossibility to reach its prospective gold, gold which at times can make its zeal and relentless fury all the more ferocious. This insight helps to further an important point about the Dionysian and establish a distinction in two directions. First, the concept of an energetic power surely might ring disconcerting for those who insist that power is still something that, in the first instance, is to be resisted. And, not to be mistaken, Everything that has been said so far is no negation of the possibility of resistance against specific forms of subjectivation which might be individually perceived and with good reason as subjection to outside forces. However, against an analysis that associates Foucauldian power still exclusively with political power and thus falls back into merely remaining in the position of resistance to a critique of all power, it needs to be pointed out that the celebration of life in all its aspects is only possible through the acceptance of the basic feature of an energetic power. Yet, turning this proposition around, one should equally beware the easy and naive veneration of the Dionysian as inherently good. The connecting of the Dionysian to power in an energetic fashion also helps to reassert the distinction in this direction. What already surfaced in chapter 1 in the interplay between the Apollonian and the Dionysian can here once more be affirmed with an energetic power. One of the main points about the interplay between the Apollonian and the Dionysian is exactly that they are not identical to the binary distinction between the forces of good and the forces of evil, no matter which of the two is associated with which of those forces. The identification of the Dionysian with energetic power also serves to stress that point. This identification indeed might ring just as strange in the ears of those who associate the Dionysian energetic with something inherently good, as with those who try to fight power at all costs. The crucial practice could once more consist in that Nietzschean gesture of celebration of life that is not borne out, of turning a blind eye on some of life's parts, and simply negating the existence of everything that does not fit, but that would consist in an affirmation of life in all its forms and moments. References to this affirmation of life can be found all throughout Nietzsche's creative life. It is in the context of Ichi Omo, 1989, that Nietzsche's translator and commentator, Walter Kaufman, remarks in the editor's introduction about the connection to Nietzsche's personal life. A man in physical agony much of his adult life and warned by his doctors not to read and write much, lest he strain his half-blind eyes, does not once complain. He is thankful for his illness and tells us how it made his life better. Nietzsche himself prefaces the first part of Echeumu on the day of his 44th birthday by recounting the presents he has received throughout the previous year and asking, how could I fail to be grateful to my whole life? This affirmation of life in all its facets, this attitude of saying yes to life, even in its strangest and hardest problems. <laughs>
is also a cornerstone of Nietzsche's philosophy and is to be found amongst others extensively also throughout the gay science, the twilight of the idols and the will to power. This affirmative life is beyond good and evil because it is characterized, as Gilles Deleuze points out, by its freedom from the moralizing categories of resentment towards the other and bad consciousness towards oneself. It is in this affirmation of life that ultimately a letting go and letting fate of its aspects, not just those perceived as painful, but just as well the joyful ones, might take place. In this way, the own life might so become what Wolfgang Schirmacher calls a gelingesden living, a life of accomplishment. A life that accomplishes itself not because it has been cognitively willed to succeed, but that succeeds, on the contrary, behind our back and without our knowing. It succeeds out of a stance of gelassenheit, releasement, which implies an affirmative acknowledgement of our existence in a moment of cognitively letting go. The Gelingen des Leben, Schirmacher asserts, is always spoiled once one tries to rationally tackle and grasp it, whereas it can be lived with a gelassenheit which does not try to force it but gives it the space to unfold on its own accord, as it invariably does. Acknowledging life in its different aspects, affirming it, might so be a step towards a verwindung of individuality in a becoming and practice of letting go of what we have become. Finally, it needs to be pointed out that this fading does not imply a forgetting. Besides the question of whether a willed forgetting might be possible at all, it is also not what is desired here. This letting go much rather has the implication of an integration in which the individual elements fade into the background towards the formation of a transrational, relational, and thus transpersonal art of the self which establishes itself in each present moment anew. Friedrich Nietzsche shows how such integration might take place when, in Ichi Omo, he sets out to show how one might become what one is, recounted in the words of O. Leary as follows. Quote, For Nietzsche, to become who one is, is to integrate and unify all those traits, habits, and experiences that make up one's character. However, there is no state of being unified that replaces an earlier state of becoming. Rather, unity is a continual process, a process not of improvement and perfection, but of integration and stylization. This is a process in which the individual gradually owns and disowns by modifying more and more of their characteristics and experiences. This process implies an acceptance, an affirmation of what we have become so far and enables a vervind in this letting fade. Such process dissolves blockages by redeeming and affirming parts of the self previously rejected or suppressed. 4.7 Conclusion Throughout the present chapter, setting out once more in a Foucauldian vein, the idea of the Dionysian was related to Foucauldian power. While traces and elements of this interpretation were certainly inherent already in Foucault's writing, his idea of power was here remodeled and twisted in to an energetic direction. This interpretation should not be perceived as a rejection of the conventional conceptualization of political power, which continues to be of often critical importance, but by stressing different elements and putting to the fore unusual aspects, we arrived at a novel understanding of power. The point of departure was a differentiation of the understanding of power it was to be worked out from its conventional interpretation. Therefore, firstly, 
a short introduction was given on understandings which equate power with a combination of discourse and practice. Secondly, some features of power in Foucault's own rendering were established, foremost among them its productivity, relationality, and the form of subjectivity, the subject as form, that goes hand in hand with them. Thirdly, the question of relationality was reconsidered from the point of view of the aesthetic energetic. Via this relationality, fourthly, the Foucauldian rendering of power was complemented with a Dionysian element, which led to a transrational energetic power in interplay with rationally apprehensible forms, discourses and practices. In a third transposition, via an intermediary step of discussing the imminent interpretation of power, the study arrived therefore at an energetic power, further adding to the picture of the Apollonian and Dionysian established in previous chapters. Fifthly, this energetic power was so identified as force of life and the hypothesis of an energetic aesthetic sphere was proposed. This led sixthly to a crucial differentiation for the art of the transpersonal self as celebration of life in all its form towards a possible fading of subjectivity. The art of the self was portrayed as an art of vervindun of subjectivity, an art also of fading and letting go. We might not, no longer have hopes of breaking through into an ordinary outside beyond the Apollonian Dionysian. But within such a practice of the self, an impure, an imperfect freedom can be found. Such freedom is understood as the possibility to partially transform oneself and ultimately opens up the prospect for a fading of subjectivity. One is so approaching the possibility of giving the whole life a certain style, of turning oneself into a work of art through an affirmative aesthetic and energetic practice for a self engaged in a constant becoming.